Thank you very much, uh, Steve. I, I deeply wish my mother were still with me. She would have really appreciated that introduction. <laughs> Thank you all for being here and for the chance to, to share and uh, for us to have some time together. And as we, as we enter this time together, I'd like to create some space for us to, to have a journey. Let's take a little thought journey together, okay? I'd like you to think back to when you were in the eighth grade. Now, so for some of you, that's probably a longer journey than others, but <laughs> just take the journey. Think about the decisions you were making. Think about what you were doing in the eighth grade. Everybody about there? Okay, fantastic. Now, for a very courageous few of you, and I can see it is very few of you, try thinking back to 1966. I ask you to do that because that's when I was in the eighth grade. Okay, stop doing the math. It was 51 years ago, okay? Because when I was in the eighth grade, some things happened to me that really transformed my life and set me on the course that is... That, with all of my experiences, have brought me to the place that I am today. The first was in the area of agriculture. I was uh, the fifth generation, I suppose it was, to be a farmer on the land that's been in our family currently almost 200 years. And I was being prepared to be a farmer. And I had achieved a milestone in the eighth grade in 1966 in animal husbandry. And what you see here is the 1966 Reserve Grand Champion Shorthorn Division for the Alabama Livestock Exposition. I'm the one in the hat, by the way. I had trained that steer. I had selected it. I had taken care of that steer. I had won the prize. And I want you to know, as we stand here in Denver, Colorado, that was a good looking steer. <laughs> At the same time, I was approached by my science teacher, Ms. McFillin. She said, uh, why don't you enter a science fair? Now, I didn't know what a science fair was. You know, I was a country kid. And she said, well, you can compete and you can kind of uh, do some things to, to get recognized and maybe win an award or something. And I said, well, Ms. Mac, what, what would I do? And she says, well, you're good in math and you're good in science, so why don't you do a project around this new math called Boolean algebra? She said it's the way computers think. Now, I'm quite sure she expected me to do some research, to talk to some experts, and make one of these wonderful science fair presentations with the three poster boards. But you know, I'm kind of a hands-on sort of guy. So I built this. It's a one-line computer. I found some switches off of an old Trailways bus, and had the bus been there when I returned, I would have put the switches back. <laughs> there are lots of defining moments in my life. I took a, a headlight off of an old uh, tractor, we didn't work at night anyway, and a hand crank generator out of an old-style telephone. And this one-line computer solves a Boolean equation. If switch A and switch B are on, and either switch C or switch D is on, and you turn the crank, the light will light up. And I won! It was math! It was fantastic! And it was at that point in time that I realized I had choices, that I could, in fact, be a farmer but I could also be an engineer or a scientist. As, as it turned out, I, I chose to be an engineer. Well, actually, in 1966, you didn't really choose to be an engineer. It was more of a diagnosis. <laughs> and, well, let me share with you a, a little clip from our friend Dilbert, who kind of shows you what it was like when you discovered you were going to be an engineer. I have the knack. The knack? for technology. My mom says I always have. I'm worried about little Dilbert. He's not like other kids. What do you mean? Yesterday, I left him alone for a minute and he disassembled the TV, our clock, and the stereo. That's perfectly normal. 
Kids take things apart. Oh. The part that worries me is he used the components to build a ham radio set. Oh dear. Is that bad? Normally I'd want to run an EEG on him, but the machine isn't working. It's worse than I feared. What is it? I'm afraid your son has the knack. The knack? The knack. It's a rare condition characterized by an extreme intuition about all things mechanical and electrical and utter social ineptitude. <laughs> My poor sainted mother, it was, it really was somewhat of a diagnosis. I was, however, and did become an engineer. And I tell you that story to place my life and my experience in this continuum of what we call the industrial revolutions. As we think about the industrial revolutions, they've occurred in four stages. The first, of course, began in the early, or in the mid-1700s with the introduction of steam and water power to help work be done. And then by 1870, we had mass production, the, the, the assembly line type of things with a division of labor and with electrical machines. And then by the third industrial revolution, which began roughly in 1969, it was about computerized machines, about working with computers. And I've lived through that entire Industrial Revolution. The fourth Industrial Revolution began by most accounts in 2010, where we will see a movement toward cyber physical uh, systems and human beings working in concert with machines, with machines doing very high level in, uh, activities that previously were done by, by, by people. And it's in this world that I came into. I was born in the second Industrial Revolution lived through the third, and now entering the fourth. And this is where the children that you serve are going to grow up. And this is where you're going to spend the rest of your lives, is in at least the fourth and potentially more industrial revolutions. When I graduated from college, I knew a lot about what I was going to do. That's simply not the case today. Today, there are many, many questions. Children are faced with questions that we weren't faced with. They're faced with a future that they don't quite understand, a future that's changing dramatically and changing rapidly. In fact, Ray Kurzweil reminds us that progress in the 21st century will proceed at a rate a thousand times faster than in the 20th century. This is like building the Great Wall of China in two months rather than 200 years that it actually took. This is the world. That, your that the children you serve are living in. This is the world that you're living in. There's an interesting theory that was, that was uh, brought forward by Astro Teller, who was the CEO of Division X at Google, and he, he was talking about the range and the rate of speed that technology is accelerating. And we know that we're being governed today by a, an increasingly rapid change in technology. And he said technology would grow at an exponential rate while business the capacity of humans to create value would grow at a linear rate. Now this was an early thought that he had and, and after some reflection and in fact some work that's been done since then and presented in fact this year by Deloitte in their human capital report, it's, human, it's the Deloitte Human Capital 2017, what we really believe is happening is that technology is in fact accelerating exponentially but that human beings are far more adaptive than we ever imagined them to be. They're more adaptive to technology. What we know about cell phones, for example, is that when cell phones were first introduced, when they rang, you answered them. <laughs> really? Nobody prayed to them, okay? When they rang, you answered them. And then when smartphones came, how long have we had smartphones? Forever, right? 2007. It's when the first smartphones came. What we know is today in the United States, human beings, citizens of this, of this great country, will look at their cell phones about 8 billion times 
a day. There's only 300 million of us. You can do the math as to how many times we're looking at it. We're far more adaptive, and this is forcing business and industry to be more adaptive in trying to, to meet this need and trying to communicate to these, the values to, these, uh, to, to, to the consumers through this increasingly technologic world. And where we live in education, public policy, well, it comes in dead last <laughs> for how fast it's changing. What we know is that all of these things will work in concert as we move through this next fourth industrial revolution. So the question for us really is how do we create value? How do we create value in this fourth industrial revolution? When we look at the past and we look at how value was created, what we know is that in the first industrial revolution, it was really about strong people working and steam machines because it took a lot of physical labor to make that work. In the second industrial revolution, it was about organized people because we were talking about assembly lines, very much like we, in fact, our, many of our uh, modern plants are still built on some of these old principles of assembly line manufacturing. Ford, of course, made it famous in, in the early 1900s. In the third industrial revolution that many of us have lived through, perhaps all of us, it's about smart people working with computerized machines. And in this fourth industrial revolution, it will be about valuable people working. It will be about people who are capable of creating value in new, different, and exciting ways. And I'll submit to you that I believe the primary goal of learning in the 21st century will be dealing with how to create value in an environment of constant change. How will these children who are growing up in a world where 65% by some estimates of the jobs they will have access to have not even been created yet? How will we prepare them to be successful as we were in that type of an environment? I'm going to suggest to you that it's tied to three primary areas, what I'm going to call knowledge, skill, and attitude, or sometimes called dispositions. And I want to discuss these areas a little bit with you, and let's talk about how this works, and more importantly, how what you do underpins all of this value creation that we're going to have in the future because communication is, or will be the rails, the currency, upon which all of these things will rest. So let's talk a little bit about knowledge. When we speak about knowledge, we've primarily talked about it in the context of memorized knowledge, content that we possess. When I graduated from college, certainly as an engineer, it was the knowledge I possessed that people were interested in. As we move into this fourth industrial revolution, as we move into this fantastic new future, it will not be about the knowledge we will possess. It will be about acquiring knowledge. <clears throat> it will be about kids understanding how to learn how to learn, how to acquire knowledge. And the thing about acquiring knowledge is that it is uniquely individual. It's about making, ex making sense out of the world. It's about looking at things and making sense out of it. And, and as we help children do this, we have to help them take their experiences and make sense of them. To give you an example of what I'm talking about, these, uh, and you guys just thought you were going to listen. We're going to do some, we're going to have some fun tonight. We're going to use these things. These are called chenille stems. Now, if you're in my generation, they were called pipe cleaners. <laughs> if you, however, do this presentation in China, as I have done uh, on a, using these things, the Chinese, which is where all these are made, um, do not have a word for pipe cleaner or chenille stem. It's called fuzzy wire. <laughs> so, if everyone would take a chenille stem pipe cleaner or fuzzy wire, and make a star. I'd like you to make a star. Now, all of these exercises, all these exercises that I'm going to ask you to do tonight, I give to children, and they usually, I usually give them 45 
seconds, maybe three quarters of a minute. Uh, you're adults, you get a minute and a half, two minutes, three minutes, whatever it takes, five minutes. But make a star. Figure out how to make a star. Just let your hands do the thinking, okay? Everybody working on that? Everybody getting a star? Doesn't, it, no, you don't get extra points for pretty, but if it is pretty, that's good. We enjoy that. But a star, see? Everybody have a star? Yes, I've done this before, but it still takes me time. Everybody created a star. We got stars? Hold your stars up. We have five-sided stars. I see six-sided stars, four-sided stars. You ever, you, there you go. Look, look at all these wonderful stars. Have you ever wondered wh why we call this a star? When we tried to make sense as humankind, when we looked into the heavens and we saw those things, those bright pieces of light in the heaven, we weren't sure what to call them. But somebody decided, let's call them a star. And if you look at this and you look at the stars in the sky, you'll find that it has points of light that come out from it. And this is what that looked like. And as humankind began to make sense of it and call this a star, they looked in the world that they lived in and they saw a fish on the beach that was shaped more or less like a star. And they called it a starfish. And they held the fish and the stars in such great esteem that they decided that star was a characteristic. And so now we have... Stars in, in entertainment, stars in sports. We have, uh, we have stars. We have stars we give out to kids because we want them to know that they feel good. All of this in an effort to make sense of why does that light shine in the sky and what do I call it? You see, it's about acquiring knowledge. It's about making sense of it. And this is what our kids need to do. And this is what our kids have to be led to in all of their educational experiences. Now, once we've, once we've gotten some knowledge and we've made some sense out of our world, we have to then be thinking a little bit about the skills that are necessary to work within that world. Now, the Partnership for 21st Century Learning speaks about these skills as creativity, critical thinking and problem solving, collaboration, global, global uh, competency, citizenship, among many others that we talk about. And when we think about that, the first is creativity. Now, what is creativity? The, the definition I like to use for creativity is that it's the ability to come up with ideas or artifacts that are new, surprising, and valuable. Okay? New, surprising, and valuable. Now, with that as, a, as an understanding of creativity, think about it, guys. How many of you here are creative? How many creative people do we have? Oh, well, we're doing pretty good for this crowd. Grab another pipe cleaner, fuzzy, fuzzy wire, or chenille stem. Whenever we give gifts to each other, we wrap them in paper, right? And, oh, listen. And, and, so, don't, and, and, and we hear the, the angst, don't make me make a bow. Yes, make a bow. Because I'm going to give you a present. I'm going to give you a gift. Everybody make a bow. Everybody make a bow. doesn't have to be, let your hands do the, do the thinking. Don't think about it too much. Just do something. It's your present. You can make a bow that looks any way you want it to look. Make a bow. Make a bow. We doing okay, guys? Make a bow. Just let your hands do the thought. You're overthinking it. Make a bow. Everybody got a bow? How are we doing? We got bows? We got bows in the back? We got bows? Look around your table. Anybody have a bow other than the color? Anybody have a bow that is 100% identical in size, shape, and configuration to your bow? Maybe similar, but is it identical? Anybody see one that's identical? Similar. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. You are all 100% of you creative. You have all created something that is new. It's valuable. It's different. I 
I love this. When we think about creativity, when we think about creativity, many of us believe that, we're, that only a few people have it and they're born with it. But research shows, in fact, that almost 100% of five-year-olds will test as creative geniuses. And after 20 years of the best education we can provide, only 3% of adults will test as creative geniuses. I would ask you to imagine, just imagine, what the world would look like if we could maintain the creative potential of children throughout their entire educational experience. You see, for children, it's not about, about teaching them to be creative. It's about not unlearning it. For adults, it's about recapturing what we have never lost. We have all been creative. A hundred percent of us are born creative. We just lose the ability over time because of unintended consequences of our life and the regimentation that happens. We must keep our children in an environment where they can be free and open to have a level of creativity that allows them to look at the world through different lenses. I'm also going to say to you that creativity in and of itself will be insufficient because creativity must lead to innovation. Because innovation is what creates, is what creates value, creates business results. And when we move from creativity to innovation, we move from the thrill of, of creation and difference to the real work of innovation and innovating. And we have to make that link for our kids. That's why project-based learning is such an important part of the educational experience. Said another way, you can have creativity without innovation, but you cannot have innovation without creativity. Or I always like this quote from IBM. It says, creativity is the raw material of innovation, and innovation is creativity implemented. That's the, that's the world that our children are going to have to perform in. That's what they're going to have to be able to do, is be creative and to innovate. So they acquire some knowledge, and they're very creative, and they've innovated, and they've run into some challenges. We know that's going to happen, so we have to be sure that our kids can think critically, and they can solve problems. In our school system today, in public schools, and, or not in public schools, in schooling across the world, as a result of many, many well-intended initiatives, we've taken critical thinking, problem solving, and we've reduced it to primarily a cognitive task. And then we test it. We give a test. Here, I'll, I'll share one with you. You get, get to participate in this. It's, uh, it's a test that's used in, in, um, in end of year uh, schooling and that sort of thing. Here you go, list in any order the four seasons. Okay, everybody have it in your mind? Good. When this was administered to some kids in rural Texas, 67% of them said this, Dove, deer, <laughs> duck, and turkey! <laughs> now, is that answer wrong? No. That answer, and not only is that answer correct, it's in the correct order. That's the order the seasons come in. You see, it's just, it's not where kids are learning to think critically and solve problems. It's the ability to, to understand that there are many different ways to solve a problem. Grab another chenille stem, fuzzy wire. You're going to get used to this. Everybody know what a square is? Uh, not, not, I'm, I'm talking about a geometric square, not, my, not what I was in high school, okay? It's a rectangle with four equal sides. Make a square. Make a square. It's a rectangle with four equal sides. Make a square. Oh, now I can tell it that I can tell these challenges are getting a little more, a little more difficult. Maybe not so bad. We're starting to get a square. We're starting to get a square. I'm sure you guys are thinking, my goodness, we didn't know we were going to have to work this hard tonight. We thought it was going to be left alone. We got a square? People getting squares? Now, many of you are asking rightly, what on earth does, make it, does this square have to do with this whole notion of critical thinking and problem solving? It has nothing to do with it. 
what, it has, what has to do with it is the process that you used. How many of you estimated it? So, well, it kind of looks like if I bend it here, here, and here, it'll turn out about that way. That's a legitimate way to do it. Some of them make a circle, and then you kind of mush it together so that it turns into a square. Some of you may have taken, a, uh, taken it, folded it in half, folded it in half a second time, and then unfolded it. At right angles, exactly, I hear the right angles. Uh, I love that. Engineer talk makes me feel good, you know, orthog or orthogonal axes, okay, yeah. We're, we can go down that road. Oh, wait, wrong presentation, sorry. Uh, it's about understanding that the process of solving the problem is as important as the solution. There are many, many right answers. There are many, many right answers in what we do. And as we work together, as we begin to solve problems, we recognize that we're going to have to learn to work in a team, to collaborate. Now, I'm not talking about collaboration in the context of the collaborative tools that we have that are online, that allow us to work together. That's a form of collaboration. I'm talking about the collaboration we do human to human. It's that form of collaboration because I believe that collaboration has two elements. It has the heart, which is, share, which is respect, and the mind, which is sharing. And unless we learn to respect, we will never learn to share. And that's a lesson that children, well, that's a lesson that adults need to learn, okay? In this very divisive world we live in in many ways, we need to learn to respect each other. And through that respect, learn to share with each other because there's no limit to what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. This is the level of collaboration we must have because we're working across, across cultures, across geographies, across time zones. We're working today in a much, much different world. We have children today who have cohorts that they're working with in different countries, in schools. Perhaps you have some in your schools. We have to help our children understand how to collaborate and to re learn to respect each other and learn to share. As we come to this table trying to learn to share and learn respect, it calls into a, to question our attitudes. Now, I look at, as an, at an attitude as a habit of thought which must be manifest in behavior. It's a habit of thinking that must be manifest in behavior. In the education community, we typically hear this talked about in the context of dispositions. We look at Dweck's work and Duckworth's work around grit, perseverance, the theories of self, the growth mindset, these types of things. All of those are important. The message I would like you to understand is that attitudes, dispositions if you will, they're caught more than they are taught. And kids catch these attitudes from the people in their world, the adults in their life, the kids in their life. And those attitudes can be nurtured in a positive way, or they can be destroyed in a very negative way. I'd like to share a, a personal experience, and I hope you guys will understand that those are the only kind I ever have. I've never had an out-of-body experience. <laughs> So all of my experiences are very personal, and this actually happened after I became an engineer. I was working one day, only six months after I joined the company Schlumberger, and I was working at what's called a wellhead. It's where the, the, the uh, it's called a Christmas tree, but the valves are out of the ground, but there's no rig. And so in order to lower things into it, you have to bring your own rig, a derrick truck. And the way these derrick trucks work is they lift up, and then there's have multiple sections, and these sections are pushed up with hydraulic uh, tubes, and then there's some what's called dogs or catches, latches that latch in to hold that all together because the hydraulics in the lifting tubes bleeds off during the time, during the time that you're there. Well, I've done a successful job. I was a six, I'd been working for six months as a field engineer. I had, I, I was, thought I was in pretty good shape. And, finished the job and I was about to rig the, the uh, uh, dirt truck down and I thought I would help. So I walked over and to the horror and dismay of the, of the people who actually understood how this truck worked, 
I pull the lever that just pulled the dogs out of the top section. Well, guess what happens? It drops about 10 feet, and we don't have hydraulic tubes. We've got hydraulic elbows. I tore that truck up. I had never torn up anything that expensive in my life. I had never seen anything that expensive in my life. And I went back to the district, the place where I was working, doing the only thing I thought I could do, which was resign. I mean, I didn't have enough money to pay for this truck. And so I'm sitting in there at the desk in the engineer's office, writing, trying to figure out how to write my resignation letter. And my district manager from Homa, Louisiana, I was stationed in Homa at the time, Fenner Dupree Whitman. <laughs> he walked in and he said, turn the head. He had that high voice, turn the head. Now, I'll let you figure out why he called me turnip head, but he said, what are you doing? I said, oh, Mr. Whit, I guess you saw that truck. He says, oh, I did see that truck. You tore it up. I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, what are you doing? Well, I don't know what else to do. I'm, I guess I got to resign. I don't know. I, I just don't know what to do. And he said, well, turnip head, you must feel pretty bad right now. I said, oh, Mr. Whit, I feel so bad. He said, I bet you feel pretty low right now. I said, oh, Mr. Whit, I feel so low I could walk upright under a snake's belly. He says, I bet you feel completely worthless. I said, Mr. Whit, you have never seen a more worthless man in your life. And he said, well, son, I'm going to tell you something. And I said, I kind of looked up, and he said, no one is truly worthless. And I'm starting to feel pretty good. He said, that's right, son, no one is truly worthless. I'm going to use you as a bad example. <laughs> now, I'm not going to say what that says about leadership, but I will say he saw something in me he wasn't willing to just let lie. He saw me confusing what I did with who I was. He saw me taking a mistake, an expensive mistake, a mistake I learned a lot from, and turning that into a destination rather than a journey to success. He would not allow me to wallow in Pity City. He allowed me to visit there, but he did not allow me to move there. And that's something we must do for our children. We must allow them to experience failure in a positive, supportive environment so that they understand it is not a value-laden destination. It is, in fact, an opportunistic journey to success. We must do that. And in the field that you work, it's a place that is replete with opportunity. I, I can remember so many times with my own son, he, was, he started speech and debate in the eighth grade. And, and by the way, because of people like you, I haven't won an argument since he was in the eighth grade. <laughs> I just want you to know what, what you're doing works, okay? But, but he would come in, and I'd say, how'd you do? And he said, ah, I did great. Sometimes he'd come in, well, how'd you do? Well, I didn't do so good. Well, did you do the speech the same way? He says, yeah, I did it exactly the same way. I said, well, why didn't it work? He says, I don't know, Dad. It's a subjective sport, you know? And you've got you to get that through your head. And, and uh, I was speaking, I think, with Renee, talking about you can control what you can control, very good advice, but you can't control the judges. And so sometimes it doesn't work and sometimes it does. In your environment, with what you do, you, among all others in a school, can help a child understand the critical importance of dealing with failure because far too many children have been reduced to a test score and not to a person. And that is wrong on so many levels. And you're in a place to counteract that and let me encourage you to do that because underpinning this knowledge, skills, attitudes, is this notion of communication. Don't you like that? I I'm, will say to you, I'm not going to lecture or talk about communication. This is your field. But I'm going to give you, share with you some experiences about how communication works and has worked across my experience across the globe. Because communication is something that is culturally embedded. It's not only embedded in the language, it's embedded in the culture. And all the cultures I've been to, they have this adage, we have only one mouth and two ears. So communication is a lot about listening. It's a lot about listening. I recall when I lived in Paris, 
at one point in my career, I had a team member, uh, Pierre, and he was a large man, a very Tate-like man. For those of you who knew Mr. Tate, a very large man and uh, garrulous and wonderful personality. And I would come up with these fantastic ideas, and I was going to change things, and we were going to implement new processes and make this thing happen. And he would sit there and mutter under his breath, Kill Casme P.A. Kill Casme P.A. For those of you who speak French, that literally translates as what breaks my feet. And I assumed he had a, had a, a problem with his feet, and it was podiatry, and, and, and I was very concerned about him because he brought it up at every meeting. And finally, I, I talked to my uh, assistant, Pascal Poteau, and I said, Pascal, I'm really worried about Pierre. And she says, why? And I said, well, every time I bring up a new idea in these meetings, he's always talking about something breaking his feet. I don't understand it. And she said, oh, you understand the words, but you don't understand the meaning. I said, well, what's the meaning? She says, well, you know, what breaks your feet in French is a little bit like uh, a pain in the butt in English, only lower. <laughs> okay. I didn't understand the cultural implications. It's like when I work with, with Lego. The Danes, when they speak to a Dane, they're the, most, they're the most delightful people because they're smiling and they're always nodding their head when they're talking to you or saying, okay, yes. And they're giving you feedback. It's fantastic. And as an American, I made this wonderful presentation. Everyone in the room was nodding their head. And I'm going, this is fantastic. I go back to my team and I said, they bought it. There was not a single head that wasn't nodding. There was no one who was not go agreeing with me. We are in. And then I got an email with 80 questions about that presentation. And I called Jens. I said, Jens, my uh, colleague, I said, Jens, what are these questions about? He said, well, we, you know, we, need to, we need to answer these questions as to decide if we want to go forward with this project. I said, I don't understand, Jens. I was in there. Every one of you, you were nodding your head. He says, oh, that was the Danish I heard you. Really? He says, yeah, that's not the Danish I agree with you. I said, well, what does the Danish I agree with you look like? He said, it looks exactly the same. <laughs> Who knew that there's some special genetic ability among the Danes to figure out when it's I agree and I, uh, and I, uh, and I heard you? And many times in meetings I would say, hang on, is that the Danish I agree or the Danish I heard? So it helps us to realize that communication underpins so much of what we do as we acquire knowledge, as we, as we learn these skills, as we work together. And we must, we must, we must, at all cost, teach our children that communication is something that makes us uniquely human and should never, never be abdicated to technology. Technology is a tool. We should never use technology to replace communication. Communication at its best and at its most significant and at the level that is least able to be replicated is between human beings. And all too often I see technology taking the place of good human-to-human -human interaction. How many of you ever gotten an email all in caps? <laughs> oh, wow, they're mad at me. No, I didn't know that you could turn the little cap thing off. I just didn't know how that worked. We have to recognize that. Let me, let me give you an example of kind of what I see happening. Here's an example of a couple of kids. Uh, they're talking, but they're using cell phones. Uh, by the look of it, I think they're arranging a play date. What do you think? And the, the play date must have gone okay because they stayed together, they're dating now, and now they're texting. Everybody look at that, that young woman's eyes. <laughs> Down in the South, we call that snake-eyed and bird-lipped. I don't know what stupid thing that man texted, but his backup beepers are wide open trying to get him out of it. <laughs> and it must have turned out all right because they became the digitally connected family of the future. And there's dad, ever the fashion icon, still on the phone. There's mom, having discovered iTunes or potentially Valium. I don't know. <laughs> Who knew? There's the young girl trying to talk to somebody and she's speaking to the air and of course there's the son plugged into the ubiquitous computer with headsets, hopefully solving a grand engineering challenge but most likely playing a game. The fact is they are not talking to each other. And I cannot tell you the number of times I walk into a restaurant 
and I see a family come in and I sit and I watch and I watch them bring out the technology and I watch them pass a meal and never say a word to each other. We must not become technology. As human beings, as human beings, we're the only species on the planet that can model our world linguistically and share those metaphors and those models with each other to create value, to, to change how we, we perceive things, to share our creative ideas. We are the only species that's capable of doing that as far as we know. And we cannot allow that to be lost to the tyranny of technology. And in your activity, in your classrooms, it is always about using the spoken voice, about using all the assets in communication, because it is upon those rails that value is created. And when we think about value, we need to think about what it's going to look like in the 21st century. What does it actually look like when we do this? Last exercise for the evening. Take another fuzzy wire pipe cleaner. As you're finding it, I would like you to think in your mind of your favorite letter. Think in your mind of your favorite letter. Okay, you have it in your mind? Now make your favorite letter. I suggest you make capital letters because then you don't have to wonder if it's an L or an I. Make your favorite letter. Whatever it is, make your favorite letter. Now, everybody has to do this. Everybody's got to make a letter. Okay? Everybody have a letter? Does everybody have a letter? Okay, now here's the challenge. Here's where you get to have some fun. Take those letters at your table and make the longest word you can make out of them. All you Scrabble people, make it happen. You guys don't have ten people, so you can make, add, add, add some letters. If you've got letters, make it work. Everybody, make a letter. Make a word. If you need to buy a vowel, feel free to do buy one vowel. <laughs> buy one vowel, not a bunch. Everybody have their words? When you have a word, when you have a word, hold your hand up so I'll see that you've got a word. You've got a word. There's some words over here, words here, over there, over here. Let's keep working until we get a few more people with a word. Everybody come up with a word now. It's important. It's important that your table does this. There may be some significant, significant uh, rewards. We got some words back in this corner. You got some words? You got words? You got words? Okay, what, what, this, this, let me tell you, this is an excited team. These, this, this group here, this table here, and by the way, I'm quite sure each of you by now have decided and have understood that your table is in fact the best table in the room. I understand that. This table has been really out there about the, what they've done. What's your word? Corralled. How many words is that? How many letters? Nine letters. Oh my goodness. Anybody else have a nine letter word? What's your word? Values. Everybody hear that? Their word is values. Anybody else have a word? Yes, ma'am. Jovial. Jovial. We have a word here. What's the word over here? Swamp. 
Other words. Yes, ma'am. What did you do? Oh my goodness. Th this table actually has a, the name Jamie, and as they were making their letters, they made them in order. How about that? Okay? So let's, let's talk a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about what you just did. Let's talk a little bit about what you just did. What you just did is experienced 21st century learning at its finest. You made sense of the world. You made sense of your experiences. You collaborated. You were creative. You thought critically. You displayed a growth mindset, a positive attitude by willing to work together. You shared. You demonstrated respect. And you created a word. Throughout this conference, I would encourage all of you at your tables to let this be your table's word and work with other tables and make sentences. Work with the whole room and make a paragraph. This is how communication creates value in the future. About four years ago, I worked in an area called Education Reimagined, and we came up with a vision for the future of education, which is this vision right here. And it has five elements. It says that education should be competency-based. And when you decide it should be for mastery, not certification, it changes how you engage the child. It means that education must be personalized, relevant, contextualized. You have to tie into the passions of that child. You have to do what the child is interested in. And when you do that, then you have to recognize the child has a voice, and we have learner agency. And now when the child has a voice and you can communicate with them, because they've been taught how to communicate, you recognize that learning in the future will be socially embedded. It's not only the 20% of the day that they spend in your classrooms, it's all of the time the child is learning. And that has to be part of the entire community, not just on the backs of the teacher and the school. And when you make that decision, you recognize that education must be open-walled. As education is open-walled, it means we break down the walls of the rooms, the walls of the schools, and we allow those experiences that occur outside the schools to drive us and to be recognized and given credence so that these children understand that learning is a lifelong, full-time activity. It's not something you do to memorize for a goofy test. That's what you do. Communication underpins the future of education because without communication, without the ability to acquire this knowledge, to think critically, to, to collaborate, without happening, it was just another version of sit and get. And that's not going to create success for children because we can't describe the world they're going to work in. man once said that children are a message we are sending to a far distant future which we shall never see. Are we about the business of sending the right message? Let me challenge you. Let me push you, cajole you. Let me give you inspiration that what you do matters. Because what you do changes the lives of children. It moves them from an ability, from an inability to an ability. In a school setting, it allows change to occur and for it to be okay. What you do actually matters, and I personally thank you for that. Personally, thank you for that. Because in the eighth grade, my son, who like myself has Tourette syndrome, his life was transformed by joining the speech and debate in the eighth grade, and you made that possible. 
and everything that's happened in his life was shaped by that eighth grade decision. It truly matters what you do. Think carefully as you go through this conference that your words inspire you, that your communication buoy you. Grasp and hold on to the certain and sure knowledge that you are sending the right message to this far distant future. Thank you.